Hello, my name is Peter Bercamo. Uh, welcome to the TCAF 2020 uh, Memorial Panel for Richard Sauer. Before we begin, the Toronto Comic Arts Festival would like to honor and acknowledge the original caretakers of the land, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. We're in a territory that was subject to the Dishwekwantun Territory Belt Covenant and an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to share and care for the land. We also acknowledge that this is areas covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. TCAF makes this acknowledgement as a reminder that we are all treaty people and that we have the responsibility to the land and to each other. This acknowledgement is a touchstone of our process of thinking through what it means to live and work in the colonized land as an expression of solidarity with our Indigenous siblings. TCAF commits to strengthening its relationships with Indigenous communities in Toronto and increasing Indigenous voices and perspectives in our programming. Today, our panel is going to be led by Eric Reynolds, a good friend of Richard's, and I would like to hand things over to him. Thanks, Peter, and thanks, TCAF. Um, welcome to the TCAF uh, 2021 uh, Richard Sala Memorial. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to be able to discuss Richard's work and life with um, several of my friends here who were friends of Richard's um, and knew him um, quite well. Uh, I would like to welcome, um, I have to start with Daniel Klaus. He was uh, Richard's best friend and vice versa um, for over 30 years. Um, Dan is the author of the books Like a Velvet Glove, Cast in Iron, um, Ghost World Caricature, David Boring, Ice Haven, Wilson, Mr. Wonderful, The Death Ray, The Complete Eight Ball, Patience, uh, and most recently Original Art, uh, Daniel Klaus Studio Edition. I um, also have Adrian Tomina, um, member of the quote-unquote Berkeley Trio, the, comprised of him and Dan and Richard. Adrian is uh, most recently the author of The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist, uh, one of my favorite books from last year, um, Killing and Dying, Shortcomings, Optic Nerve, and many others. Uh, thanks, Adrian, for coming. Um, or for being here. I guess you didn't really come, go anywhere. Um, we also have Rena Ayuyang, um, Bay Area cartoonist, uh, from originally from Pittsburgh, author of the book, uh, the Eisner uh, nominated book, Blame It on the Boogie, and also the publisher of Yam Books, and um, author of Whirlwind Wonderland. Uh, thank you, Rena. And Eric Haven, last but not least, author of the books Cryptoid, Compulsive Comics, uh, Vague Tales, uh, Year or Er, um, Tales to Demolish, and many other comics. Um, I am Eric Reynolds. I'm the associate publisher of Fanographics. I worked with Richard on several of his books and um, also considered him a friend for over 25 years, I suppose, um, or close to it. Um, I would be I, I would be remiss not to start with you, Dan. I think you knew Richard the longest of any of us. Um, you wrote a wonderful piece when Richard passed away that was published on the comicsjournal.com that anyone who's who's interested enough to watch this panel, I, I hope would go read that if they haven't already. Um, but why don't you just walk us through how you met Richard and what you remember of that day? It was kind of a momentous day for you. Yeah, I met I met Richard. Uh, same day I met my wife of now 25, 26 years. Um, it was a, uh, a signing at the comic store in Berkeley, the famous comic store, uh, Comic Relief, that Adrian, uh, Richard and I went to every Wednesday for many years till, till Adrian abandoned us. <laughs> in New York. Um, but it was, it, he had I had actually corresponded with Richard before that he was he was like the one person who was a fan of my comic Lloyd Llewellyn and when that got canceled he wrote me this long effusive letter and I was I was completely taken aback because I thought he was like one of those New York guys who worked for Raw I thought he was like I figured he like lived in Soho in New York and he was this real like super high level guy from the art world and so I couldn't believe he would like such a stupid 
throw away <laughs> comic is Lloyd Llewellyn. <laughs> and so we developed a correspondence. And of course, after a while, I realized not only was he not this New York art guy, he was actually, he had never been to New York in his entire life. He never once went to New York. He only, he'd never went to Canada either. So it's funny we're doing this in, uh, in Canada. He ne never left the country in his entire life. Actually was uh, almost never left California, Arizona or Chicago. Those were the only three places he ever visited. Um, and, you know, he, as you guys all know, Richard presented as being very kind of avuncular and affable in person. You'd think he's the most outgoing guy. He's got a million friends. He's the life of the party. But he was not that. That He had that ability to turn on the charm, but he was, um, he was just so uh, sheltered and self-lacerating and, and uh, it was, it was really hard to kind of figure him out at first. I remember that day I met him, I said, you know, I would love to come by your, your studio, you know, like now I'm in town, I'd love to see your studio. And he was, and he said, well, that's not going to happen. Like, I was like, what? <laughs> like, who is this guy? Like he made it like, why would I let you do that? And it wasn't for a long time until he finally invited me to his studio. So, um, you know, my friendship with him over the years was just this evolving process of trying to understand this deeply enigmatic fellow. I realized that probably before I even asked you anything, I should just preface this a little bit. I, I assume everybody's familiar with Richard who's watching this, but maybe they're coming because they're a fan of one of your books. Um, and you know, this is an opportunity to introduce them to Richard's work. Uh, Richard Sala passed away uh, in 2020 um, in the spring, I think, I believe it was March. Um, and he left behind what I look back at and, and realize is really one of the most prolific careers of his generation. Um, I actually pulled out um, my books that I could have actually had handy on the shelf. And I mean, there are, there's a lot of them. He was a very productive, and this doesn't even count the comic books. Um, I mean, just to name a few, he did the books Cat Burglar Black, In a Glass Grotesquely, The Grave Robber's Daughter, Peculia and the Groon Grove Vampires, Maniac Killer Strikes Again, The Hidden, Delphine, The Bloody Cardinal, Violent Girls, Poison Flowers and Pandi Pandemonium, which is his new book, which we'll talk about. Um, Peculia, Mad Night, The Chuckling What's It, Violenzia, and Other Deadly Amusements. And then there's the comic books, many issues of Evil Eye, um, his first self-published book, Night Drive, um, work that he did for MTV on Invisible Hands um, for MTV's Liquid Television in the, in the early 90s. Um, he, and he worked, he had a career, you know, Dan mentions the fact that, um, you know, he thought he would be the Soho illustrator. And and you have to think that if he had been born maybe in a slightly different time and or place that he would have been one of those. Um, he, as it is, he had one of the more robust illustration careers of, of any cartoonist that any of us have known. He worked for virtually every major magazine that you could, which was, you know, the, those were the, the gigs to get in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, it's really remarkable. He, he never was not working. Um, and I think that comes through even uh, in the piece that Dan wrote for the Comics Journal uh, last year, um, which was that it was like he, his watercoloring, watercoloring for him was like breathing. Um, it was just what he did. Um, Dan, you mentioned, you know, that avuncular charm that we've all seen um, in person, you would, you really would, if you just met Richard once at a party, you'd never, never know how neurotic he really was. Um, I was struck reading uh, something that his younger sister Lucy wrote um, in the comments thread on the Comics Journal in response to your piece where she kind of described Richard as the, as the, as the glue that kept, that kept her childhood sane and that he, he was the one always smiling and, and in family photos and yeah. um, just kind of, you know, just kind of keeping the glue together from what sounded like, you know, what was at times maybe a pretty dysfunctional family. Um, he, was, he was a hero. He escaped a very troubled family and made a life for himself. And 
you know, he was so hard on himself. And I was, I would always tell him like, look at you, you're, you've made a career as an artist, your entire adult life, you've escaped your, you know, your toxic background. And here you are, you know, living in California. What's, you know, what are you complaining about? And he would, I know, I know. But, um, but he didn't <laughs> see it. But to me, it was like, beyond heroic what he turned himself into yeah um adrian i'll go to you because i think you probably knew richard uh almost as long as dan um and i haven't really talked to you about you know richard much since he yeah. passed um yeah. what do you want well let's start with you know some of your memories of of uh, you, you were such a young guy when when you met him you were like me like Richard was already like an established successful guy we you had to look up with him with some you know admiration as of, of, of oh yeah where he was yeah I mean I think he was um probably the first person in my life and I've I've since had this experience again but he was probably the first person who I knew uh his work when I was literally a child like I was I was looking at his stuff when I was living in Sacramento probably I first saw his work when I was about 11 or 12 years old and was reading it in in raw and drawn in quarterly and and places like that so yeah the idea of um meeting him when I moved to Berkeley was uh was kind of mind-blowing for me um I kind of had that same experience with Dan which is it's hard to get back in that mindset after <laughs> knowing him for so long but I really did think yeah I, I he was tied in with raw and mtv and all these things and and just my childhood you know um it's it's uh it's it's weird to to become friends with someone who you were a fan of at a completely different stage of your life and um you know i knew his work before i was a cartoonist you know yeah right right i remember richard was one of those guys maybe like you know probably like charles burns where you'd see their work in an anthology like raw um and then the styles were so distinctive that you know if you happen to see something in in tv guide or yeah. or you know or whatever magazine your parents subscribe to you'd recognize it you'd you know like oh that's that dude and you start to mm -hmm. make these kind of mental connections of, of who these people are um and what being a cartoonist is um rena I have to get my favorite Richard Sala illustration to show everybody. <laughs> sure. <laughs> In the meantime, Rena, how, when did you meet Richard? Oh God, I, I met Richard. I don't even remember what year it was, um, but it was later on. Um, I, I think Adrian was in New York, but um, it was in one of these post eight um, parties. Um, um, at, at Dan's house and I, I knew Richard from his work and I knew him from he was very prolific on like I mean he, he wouldn't go to a lot of places but he but he would he was very visible online <laughs> and he had you know Tumblr accounts and he had blogs and so you, it was just amazing how much work he put out but um, um I I think one time it was like Ben Catmull. It, it, it kind of felt like a Richard Sala uh, story in that Ben, I bumped into Ben Catmull in front of like Pete's or something. And he's like, Rena, um, Richard Sala and Dan Klaus were like, to, it was, it just felt like a Richard Sala story where like, they'd like to meet, you know, they, we, they like to get together and, you know, and have dinner. And it just felt like one of those Richard Sala stories where like, oh, I'm going to some secret meeting um did you dan but, did you and richard send ben as your emissary or? i think we just said something you know, <laughs> oh, we'd like to get together with with uh, yeah and ben. this was like during clap trap yeah. days and, and i've and i've tried to have richard on the show and um on the clap trap show and he was very apologetic and was like i i can't do that i mean i totally can't do that but i met him at a party and it and it was just really cool because um I, Vanessa Davis was there and Richard was there and is having this conversation of these two people that were just amazing at, at color work that they and and them talking about how they they did their craft with color was just, was just really exciting to hear but 
but it was also weird because R Richard was this sort of this bashful guy. He had this really soft voice, and you wouldn't have known that, it, it, especially if you knew him online, because he was very <laughs> passionate about what he liked. He, you know, he was very passionate about his his. He had commentaries about things. He was very very opinionated, and it was it was fun, and also it was sometimes exasperating and just like Richard you just need to calm down it's, it's gonna be okay TCM will will come back on the air you know free um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's how I met Richard was through, <laughs> was through the post ape things and then and then just seeing around um the neighborhood and, and being able to like just have I think our where's our quarterly dinners with him yeah and quarterly just talking is yeah, guys, it was. You guys I mean, get together, we, we tried to we tried to get together, but unless over the years would he show up? You know, he'd always yeah. excuse. We kind of do, yeah. Um, it was probably because of our, uh, maybe because of our presence. I don't know, but <laughs> um, um, but yeah, that that's how I met Richard, and um, it, he it was really cool because we talked about um, movies and pop culture and I, I, I appreciate it because he was always very passionate when we would talk about things and he really it really felt like he you know he's not a, I don't you know he's not a great actor or anything but he <laughs> but it just felt like he was really interested in, in having conversations um, with you about stuff he's passionate about so I really appreciate it. Background actors and Perry Mason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Eric, uh, your turn. Um, tell me your first Sala memories or experiences. Uh, well, um, his work was so ubiquitous. Um, it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I had the same reaction, I think, that Dan did, like that this guy is some kind of slick illustrator living in New York or LA or something. Um, rich, uh, you know, fancy clothes, <laughs> and, and, because it was everywhere, and not just not just the big magazines and not just the comics, but also like the local newspapers and the local free free weeklies. Everywhere, it was his work was everywhere. Um, so I was surprised when I finally met him, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think it was at a at a at a signing that. Adrian and Seth were doing in San Francisco. And I went there and Dan and Richard were there and Dan introduced me to Richard. And, you know, I was taken aback like, ah, Richard saw it. <laughs> this, not what I expected. But what was awesome was that that very initial meeting, I could tell looking at him, he's such a genuine, kind guy. Um, there wasn't any duplicitousness or you know any ego um, in meeting another cartoonist or anything like that he genuinely wanted to to express you know whether he liked or disliked your work or um, wanted to talk about what what inspires you he, he was very um very welcoming and um, just really kind uh, and it's it's strange because once you get him going he could have like the really scathing criticisms of, <laughs> of people or art that he, that he just thought weren't worth his time. But it, you could tell that they were all it, like, he didn't mean it personally. It was just, he was very passionate. Um, but, he, it, but he had this, this other side to him that was extremely kind. Uh, I wish I could have gotten to know him better. I was surprised later um, to learn just how badly his neuroses were about leaving the house. As, as people have mentioned, he, that did not come across when you're in the room with him. He, he was totally a joy to hang out with. It was so fun. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I, I wish I had known him better. And, you know, I, I wish he had known that he had friends, you know, that, that would be willing to, you know, do whatever it takes to make sure that he's comfortable in the world. Um, and, and knows that he has friends he can lean on, but uh, um, it was unfortunate to find out how, how isolated he was. Um, well, he course, is... hmm? No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, I was just gonna say it's uh, a, a little dark, but 
um, knowing how isolated he was and how, how you know, he, he, it must have been at the end there um, during this time of COVID to not have friends and family around to, to help him. Um, he, you know, he actually loved COVID. <laughs> <laughs> it made him feel not like a weirdo. You know, nobody yeah. can go out. We can't get together. Yeah. He, he was totally into it. He was, <laughs> he was like, yeah, it's great. You know, he was so relieved not to have to go to lunch with me every week. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was so funny how much it made him feel like part of humanity in a way that nothing else had. Hmm. I think Eric, you said it well, kind of talking about his kindness and, in, in, you know, relative to, you know, his, you know what you you know the scathing sense of humor he could have, and I experienced that too. And you know regarding COVID and and his agoraphobia, like I, the last time I came through town, I had lunch with him and Dan, and you know, and you I know that it it had to like kill him just to get out of the house to go do it, but yet, but he did it, you know. And I think it's because like at the end of the day, like his, you know, his, his, I'd like to think like his sense of friendship, like out, like outweighed his, you know, his agoraphobia. Um, when, Dan, when you, do you remember when the, I don't want to get hung up on the agoraphobia, but I think back to when I first met Richard and, you know, again, like talking about kindness, like there was more than once, you know, you would often host little get togethers during eight weekend and in, in um, Berkeley or Oakland. And there was more than once where I would always be staying in San Francisco for eight, whether it was at the Fort Mason or the, the place in the concourse or whatever. And every time Richard would be the one who like offered to drive me back into San Francisco. Oh. When I knew that, when I know now in hindsight that like, that was probably like the only time he drove into San Francisco that year, you know? Um, you know back then he, he loved to drive and he had an old car that he loved. And back then he was fine with driving around as long as he didn't have to like go somewhere. Mm -hmm. you know, he was fine doing that, he enjoyed it. And then at a certain point, he just, it was torture for him to like leave the five block radius of his house. And at once a year, I would force him to go to San Francisco to go to KO Books. Cause I knew every time we went, he was like, that was the greatest day of my life. I can't believe, you know, thank you so much. And so I would make him do that. And it was such a stressful nightmare of a day trying to get him. He'd always try to back out and, you know, are you sure? I know you don't want to do this. You know, yes, I do. So, uh, but, that was his once a year trip to San Francisco. I mean, it's funny, he lived in the best neighborhood in Berkeley and he may as well have lived, you know, on the surface of Mars. I mean, he just, you know, <laughs> he, he just went to the Safeway and the comic store and that was it. He could have lived anywhere, but he, he was very comfortable there. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's talk about the work. Um, because that's what, you know. Can I do my illustration with. first? Yeah, show yeah. us the illustration. So, so Richard, you know, had this long <laughs> career as an illustrator and more and more he would get assigned little spot illustrations, you know, where you're just drawing a little thing to fill up a bunch of gray space. And he was, I would always go, you gotta do like bigger, try to do bigger, more complicated things so you don't get pigeonholed as this spot illustration guy. But it was so easy for him. And, he said there was one day where he realized like he had to just stop forever where it was, it was an article about, um, about like healthy muffins. And he said he did this <laughs> of a, uh, of a, of a muffin. There with, it is. Uh, wow. Uh, Very healthy. And, and so, you know, he thought of that as like, that's his, Waterloo, an illustration. I, I told my son about it and he thought that was like the greatest thing in the world, the idea of like the muffin. Yeah. Just so <laughs> like without a thought in your head, just hacking it out soullessly. Oh yeah. That's so, that's a that's well known shorthand in in, yeah. in our house here, yeah. right? Have and the... so Richard very kindly gave it to my son Charlie as a present and <laughs> treasure it. <laughs> 
So what's the what's the shorthand in your oh, house? Oh, just the 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 buff muffin. The idea of, <laughs> of, of either that or or Sherlock Holmes looking into a computer screen. It's just yeah. these these two classic things that he had to do. Uh, <laughs> and he that, did that muffin in thirty seconds. Yeah. Was like, Here you go. <laughs> But I, I use it to describe, you know, job offers that I get all the time where I say like, oh, I'm not going to do this buff muffin illustration. <laughs> <laughs> so proud I am. Is that a brand muffin? <laughs> yeah, it has to be. I'd right. give anything to find the article. It's in like Men's Health magazine. Yeah. 1993. But buff muffin's not going to be like a blueberry or chocolate chip muffin. Or no. <laughs> <laughs> <men's health> <laughs> so does anyone want to talk uh say what their favorite work of richards was or is rather um in a perfect world i would have loved to have sat down and like reread all of his books um prior to talking to this panel but we just didn't have the time for that but um well i read i read his new book last night this oh wow can't wait for this and uh you know, I I had gotten it in advanced copy, what was it, Eric, three months ago, maybe? Probably, yeah. And I just could not read it. Mm -hmm. You know, normally I'd get, Richard would give me one of his books when it came out, and I would read it, and I, I realized if I didn't write to him by, like, that night, he'd, he'd send me an email the next day, I guess the book was terrible and you threw it in the trash, I would have <laughs> did that. You know, so I knew I had to like I had to read it, and this one I could not read because I knew it was the last book of his. It was the last time I would hear him say something unique. You know, it's like hearing his voice for the last time. And so I put it off and put it off, and then I thought, okay, I have to read it before this thing. And so I sat down and read it, and it's it's great. It's like the distillation of everything he was and the very last story is really it almost feels like a last story if you knew you were writing your last story i mean it's really uh interesting so much uh stuff that i know is very real with him um you know i don't want to spoil any of it but it's this book really kind of has all the all the levels of richard's later work it's, and it's beautiful. It's really just a work of beauty. Like every page is beautiful. Yeah, it really is. It's basically four books in one. Four? Yeah. 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 Um, and it does kind of encompass like all of Richard's kind of broader genre interests and obsessions. And um, it was a really intimidating book to put together. I, I, I should, I guess, tell this the sad story that in like late February, I think it was, I I knew that he was almost done and we'd been in touch periodically about the book and um, and he told me he was turning it in soon. And then one day I'd say just maybe a couple of weeks before the first shutdown on the West Coast, which was like around March 11th, um, I got package in the mail from him with a flash drive and handwritten letter and um and then it was like before I'd even had a chance to start on it really we were in the lockdown and the book was late enough that it hadn't that it had to be rescheduled so there wasn't a hard and fast deadline on it yet and um you know the next thing we knew was he he had died suddenly it was it was you know it's completely unexpected um so I felt a you know pretty huge responsibility just trying to put the book together in a way that would that would not only do him justice but also that he would like, and that's not the easiest thing because he had very particular ideas and tastes and I couldn't always predict them. Um, so in a way that was kind of intimidating, and I leaned on Dan a lot um, just to just to you know lend his eyes to it and um, make sure we weren't screwing anything up too wildly um but it, yeah it was a really bittersweet book to get put book to put together but i think it's pretty fantastic and i'm kind of curious dan now it's been a few months since i've read it actually i have to go reread that last story um after what you just said because i'm not sure i realized that when i first read it 
Um, but it's a great book and it is coming out, um, gosh, like now, I think. Um, Poison Flowers yeah. and Pandemonium. Yeah. Um, my favorite book of his was, has traditionally been the Chuckling What's It. Um, that was a book that was serialized in an anthology called Zero Zero um, that was published by Fanographics and edited by Kim Thompson in the 90s. And there was a time when that was like one of the most exciting things happening in comics at that time. Like you'd get a new Zero Zero or in the office, you know, Kim would be putting together a new Zero Zero and Richard's pages would come in and it was like, oh, the, the next chapter of the Chuckling Wants It. And, um, I still think it's, you know, maybe my favorite work of his, um, although it's, you know, part of it's kind of my nostalgia of, of when it came out and where I was at the time, but um, I think it holds up. But um, what about you, Adrian? Do you have a favorite? I, I, I really think of different phases of his of his career as being kind of, I mean, obviously they're all of a piece, but like, um, you know, I think the first book that I bought of his was um, Black Cat Crossing. Um, and that really, to me, kind of exemplifies the, that sort of earlier phase of his of his work. Um, and then, you know, I, th I think of his later stuff, I think maybe just, just it, it stands out to me a little bit. I don't know if I would necessarily say it's my favorite, but it does stand out as Delphine. And mm -hmm. I think it, it's a, um, kind of an outlier in terms of his, his visual style. And, uh, and I don't know, I, I guess a lot, a lot of, a lot of the experience of reading Richard's work kind of depends on what the, what the reader brings to it. Yeah. What the reader brings to it and how, how deeply they connect with the work. And I think for whatever reason, Delphine was one, right. I, connected very strongly and I sensed um, more than ever some of the, the the autobiographical roots that were that were at work in in the in the fictional story and, and um, you know I felt like I had a little bit of a sense of what he was working out uh, on the page um, but also I just think it's I think it's some of his best artwork too. Yeah, it's funny because it's like it's you know you look at it you immediately know it's a Richard Sala book but there is a different slightly different tone to it it's like mm -hmm. a little bit more gravitas and a little less mm -hmm. maybe um, you know camp or something to it than than a lot of his other books. Yeah, he he talked about intentionally having that kind of whimsy <clears throat> in his work, um, but I which 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 was a big part of his style. But I, I sort of love seeing him kind of at least for one period of, you know draining that out and sort of going. Uh, yeah, a little more, a little more purely dark. Um, you know, that's just my taste. Richard's one of those few cartoonists that I've known. I think of like maybe Kim Deitch is another one um, where like well before he's done with whatever he's working on, like he's, he's thinking about the next one and, and pretty far along on it by the time he actually gets to it. Um, really just like a you know, you, a living, a, a, a living, breathing, 24 seven, you know, kind of cartoonist, you know, it's, yeah. it's like all of his, his, his appetite and curiosity for, for culture, for movies, for art, for comics. It's like, it all informed what he put on paper in a way that was um, just kind of amazing. I mean, I think Dan, you, from what I've, you've told me, um, I think that kind of comes through just in in helping his family um, just sort through his archives. Just the the, the collector, the, the Richard the collector mm -hmm. was was kind of as fascinating as Richard the artist. Oh, absolutely. He, I mean, he was he was very serious about his obsession. You know, <laughs> he had endless like scrapbooks devoted to a certain actor with just you know like. <laughs> Joseph Cornell level detail, you know, where he was, he was putting together, I just don't even know how he had time in his life to <laughs> devote. I mean, he was almost like a, like an old time, you know, movie buff, like a fan who had, you know, had scrapbooks. And I mean, I, I inherited his, his amazing childhood collection of, of uh, autographs 
where he has, you know, he has, uh, you know, Jack Webb and Harry Morgan. Like as a kid, he would he would send uh, send letters to uh, here's Jonathan Harris from. <laughs> <laughs> he would send letters to celebrities, and um, and uh, and they would write back. And so, you know, but of course, he was into the minor celebrities. So he has like autographs from Frank Cady of Beverly Hillbillies and. Um, or of uh, Green Acres, and uh, it, it, to me, this is his coolest, the coolest Richard Sala item, which is he uh, he took photographs of <laughs> the television set when he was a little kid, and so this book is just filled with photos of like Twilight Zone episodes, and uh, <laughs> and you know this one just says like mighty joe young written in <laughs> you know and so it's like he <laughs> an obsessive media nut from early on you know he uh, he went through sort of eyebrow. what do you think the i was gonna say what he, do you think that like those photographs what's that i'm sorry go ahead i was just gonna say i'm sorry go ahead continue where he was where he was reading like borges and Donald Barthelme and Kafka and stuff. And that was all internalized. But then he went back to, you know, Doc Savage and, and Sherlock Holmes and the stuff that he really loved. And I remember the last time I talked to him, he was talking about how he was listening to books on tape of Sherlock Holmes. You know, he was really just back into it for the fifth time, finding deeper reserves of that stuff. And it was, <laughs> It was really intense for him, that kind of stuff. I love talking to him about it. Books on tape of the original Conan Doyle books? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, what do you, I mean, like those photographs of the TV screens. Um, I mean, it's, I, I assume he was just, you know, he just was obsessed with those shows and just was trying to to record them in some way, but yeah. was there anything else to it? Was he using, do you think he used those as like photo reference? Was, um, probably, is there something, yeah, yeah. But yeah, he just Did you know he had those? Be What's that? Did you know that he had those bef before he passed oh, yeah. away or is that just something? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was something he, he, he talked about, it wasn't something that you just found. Well, I, I had also taken photos of the TV. That was, you know, our generation, that was, we didn't have the VCR and the, or the, you know, whatever. So, but I had taken like 10 photos off the TV and thought it was unsatisfying. He had thousands, you know, so, so I showed him my 10 photos and, oh, that's so great. Here's mine. <laughs> it was a very different experience. Yeah, I, that reminds me of uh, just, I, I think the, the, it was so maddening for him in some way to see just some, be friends with someone like me who's uh, younger and, and getting to enjoy things that he couldn't have. So I, I remember when I came back from Japan and I'd bought like this tiny, it was kind of like right before iPhones when they were still making like the really tiny cameras um, and I was showing it to him and he just looked like just, so depressed to see it and he was saying like i would have given anything to have one of those throughout my life <laughs> you know <laughs> like uh just depressed him to see that it existed now but um uh yeah he, he didn't want one but um yeah he, i'm sure he, he had dreamed of something just like it when he was a kid yeah he, he had mentioned stuff like that with um you know, doing Google searches kind of took away the entire sense of the chase of the yeah. hunt, you know, where you had to go into libraries or talk to people, like um, be a detective basically to hunt down the information you're looking for. Um, yeah, he, he, he must have hated the, the, the modern convenience of searching at your finger. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he loved it. Embraced too. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was always more tech savvy in a certain way than than of the three of us. He was the one who was most engaged with that world. And by far, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He did have like Tumblr and a lot of other things. Oh, I know. Yeah. I mean, he was like heavily engaged, you know, on social media. I mean, 
he was he was just very accessible in that in that way which is it's kind of like a you know how he he wasn't he didn't go out you know of his house sort of five block from his house but he you know if someone had a question about tools and things he would just have these paragraphs and paragraphs and of, of, of things that and he was just very welcoming in that in that way and and just um and just how prolific he was online like like again like i was saying um and and even in, into the very end he he had all his 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 work what he was working on um last year um which which you know i i would have really have loved to have seen like where he was going with that um in terms of it being a commentary of our our times because i know a lot of his work is it talks about about you know um how he, how he feels about like the political you know stuff going on and it would have been nice to kind of to to hear his his um commentary on what what's been going on um, you're talking about the currently the havoc yeah, yeah yeah i'm interested in if you if you knew anything about, about that how, how where that project was going at I really don't, you know, I mean, I guess Dan might know more than me. I just know that, like I said earlier, like even before he was done with Poison Flowers, he was already mentioning, you know, that 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 was next in the pipeline. And I mean, he just kind of was like a, he was just, it was just a, a given that, you know, you'd have a new, a new yeah. Richard book in every year or two, you know. Did you know anything more about it, Dan? I, I mean, I kind of assumed don't even know what you're talking about. Like I've never read <laughs> online. I always told him, you know, it kills the joy of getting the book. That's that's what I wanted. So I always told him I'll wait till it's printed. So I actually totally unfamiliar with what you're talking about. I, I presume that he was serious, you know, public posting stuff in real time and that what we mm -hmm. saw online is what there is basically. He would he would finish yeah. a page and post it that night. Right. <laughs> Right. One of the cool things that um, that Dan unearthed um, was a number of pages. I think there's about nine of them um, that we're publishing in the tenth issue of Now, the anthology, the comics anthology that Fantagraphics publishes. Um, and well, why don't you tell the story, Dan? You you're the one that you know that showed them to me, but. Um, they're really fascinating from an interesting period in his life. I mean, when Richard, when Richard first started his professional career with Night Drive and Hypnotic Tales, he, uh, he was in, a, in his sort of artsiest phase. He had just gone to grad school at Mills for fine art, studied with all these famous abstract expressionists. And, um, and so his work, he, th he thought of his work as as sort of excessively artsy. And he kind of rebelled against that later in his career when he, the chuckling what's it was really the beginning of just saying, I'm gonna do full on genre stories kind of filtered through that sensibility, but not sort of overtly uh, artsy, like, you know, trying to get in raw and things like that. I think that was, that was kind of the mindset he had on the early work. And so, um, but he, he mentioned like, oh, I had done a few comics before, before that artsy work and I had never seen any of it. And so when I had to salvage everything out of his apartment, you know, of course the main thing I was looking for was his artwork. And I, I found this stack of 15 or so pages that I believe are from when he was maybe an undergrad, maybe uh, 21 years old, something like that. Um, that are that are sort of a prototype for the later work he did. They're much more kind of conventionally um, about genre characters. You know, they have kind of Buck Rogers look, mm -hmm. um, Doc Savage, you know, that kind of thing. But they're also very uh, kind of almost undergroundish, hippie-ish, like Victor Moscoso-ish or something. Um, but there's such a cool early... Uh, iteration of his whole sensibility and it's just shows like he right out of the gate had this had this worldview that was completely original and and uh, ingrained not at all fabricated 
And um, I don't know, I just found these so incredibly cool and just the work of a young artist, you know, they're, they really look like somebody could have done them in 2021, except I don't know that anybody's that good at that age. I mean, he was just super talented. Yeah, they're recognizably Richard, but I have you know, it's still kind of protean and um, still figuring things out, but he's having fun experimenting with the form. Like an example. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, they're you know they're 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 bigger than I imagined. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, these are interesting. They one of the we somebody, I think maybe it was Eric mentioned that Richard's work was just ubiquitous at a time when I first started reading alternative comics and oh reading God. media. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and I mean, he really was ubiquitous. You know, he was in so many different just m mainstream newsstand magazines, but then he was also in like every comics anthology and not just the, the ones you'd think of like Raw or Blab. I mean, he was in like Deadline and... <laughs> uh, escape and um nickelodeon magazine that's right you know? yeah. i mean he was he was like he was everywhere um and and just one of the most idiosyncratic and kind of singularly recognizable styles uh, of the last you know 50 years in comics i would say um hmm. uh yeah I, I before we run out of time i was just gonna mention that um that i for got to have sort of like a 10 year span of uh, living in Berkeley, kind of in between where Dan and Richard lived. And that I've always said that that's, that was, that sort of felt like my equivalent of art school where like, I just, I, you know, um, I didn't really have any kind of training prior to that. And I didn't really know other artists, certainly not cartoonists. And that period from like 1993 to 2003, I think most weeks we got together on Wednesday and had lunch and went to the comic store. But simultaneous to that, I was sort of listening and observing and, and absorbing everything that these guys were talking about. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I really credit Richard, especially uh, with just, um, just kind of ex exposing me to a lot of different stuff that I never would have known about and uh, like, I think he was like the first guy, we talked about this a little bit before, but I think he was the first guy that really embodied that kind of high and low spirit of like being as passionate about, you know, some great work of literature that I hadn't even read and I didn't even know about or something, or, you know, some TV show on the WB or something like that. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but that was, that was really inspirational, you know, at that age when you're trying to figure out, am I like a highbrow guy or, or, you know, or trying to just figure out who you are to find out that you didn't have to have these lines so deeply drawn in the sand. Um, and, you know, and, and just beyond that, just to see, there's just a lot of stuff that I kind of learned anecdotally from him about being uh, an artist and being a freelancer and, you know, even beyond that, just personal things like that. But um, he, he was very generous with his, you know, with his knowledge. I think Rena yeah. would, could testify to this too. Like we were on a Facebook group that, He's on and, and I think he really kind of fancied being like the the wise <laughs> old man of the group a little bit um, and being able to kind of pass on information and that's that you know that's it's a good quality in a human yeah um, but I would I, at least in my experience it was never didactic it was never mm -hmm. him saying like now I'm gonna teach you young whippersnapper about something or other it was I mean if anything he was so so humble and um kind of, uh, you know, self-critical that he would never even think to, to approach, you know, even though I was like, you know, 19 years old or something like that. Um, but it was more just sort of through osmosis or just like, just going to a, a used bookstore and seeing what he was getting right. excited about grabbing for. I was like, oh, what is that? You know, and I'd take a mental note and um, yeah. And I, I, you know, I've said this before, but like he would never take credit for anything like this, but I really do think of him as one of just a very small handful of people who gave me the equivalent of an arts education, you know? That's sweet. Well, I think we only have about five more minutes. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to, to share or add that I haven't thought to ask about? I have something that I think that just to me, 
sums him up in an interesting way was I, you know, after I <clears throat> had to dig through all his stuff at his house, I found uh, this collection of magazines that he was really into. It's this uh, French film magazine called Mini, Mini Minuit Fantastique. It's sort of a famous monsters of film land uh, mixed with Cahiers de Cinema, which is really cool. So I noticed that that several issues had had these post-it notes <laughs> on the back cover. And I thought, well, what's that all about? And I lifted it up and underneath is this spider. Oh, and yeah. so I asked, his, and I know I was with him when he bought the, he, he was in his fifties when he bought the, so I asked his ex-wife, I said, you know, what's that all about? And she said, oh, he was just so terrified of spiders. <laughs> oh. And I just thought that that explains everything about him in a way. That he would, you know, he loved these magazines, but he could not look at that. An old drawing of a spider was terrifying to him. And I think that's why his work was so magnificent, because he had that sensitivity. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy because you know he's he's into horror genre right and right you, and... you, you watch <laughs> he's compelled to it yet you know and i don't think he's found a spider now that i think of it i don't think he's had a a monster a spider has he i was just thinking think the same thing <laughs> no but he could watch like a chainsawed head or something just right. be like this is stupid you know it meant nothing he was so hardened to like violent you know, uh, Dario Argento movies mm -hmm. and stuff, but a spider, you know, that's, that's <laughs> deeply horrifying. Yeah, I, I, I that's funny because I, I remember him several times talking about some incident when he was younger in Arizona and he said that he had this like visionary moment where he saw like um, some kind of spider crawling along and to him it was like proof that evil existed. I remember him saying that. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Uh, that's that's uh i have to think about that <laughs> that's like that david lynch uh documentary um where he talks about is the first time he saw a, a naked woman was was when this this obviously traumatized naked woman came walking across the street yeah. in his hometown and you realize like oh my god that it's blue velvet you know mm -hmm. it's Isab isabella rossellini and blue mm -hmm. velvet and uh Richard's one of those guys who, as the spider story kind of illustrates, is really a really a product of his own, you know, obsessions and in, in, a, in a way that just amounted to one of the great comics careers of his generation. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> and for me, doing doing this kind of thing is is very uh, very hard to accept in a way because I've been living here in New York for so long that I was in a sort of a routine of seeing Richard two or three times per year when I'd come back to visit. And so in a way, it just feels like I'm still waiting for that next return because I haven't been, been back to California in like a year and a half now. So yeah, it's a little, little bit like that phenomenon of like, you know, you know, Schrodinger's cat or something like that, where it's just like, I can sort of almost believe that life in California is still the same as when I was last there. So I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be a hard experience going back uh, probably in August, I'll do that. Yeah, like you, you, you think things are just gonna go back to the way it was pre-COVID, it's just some weird. Yeah, no, I mean, I-, I COVID alternate reality. For me, moving away, one of the hardest things to leave behind was those Wednesday get togethers, you know? And so, it was always important to kind of replicate that every time I came back. And it was always kind of amazing how, how little effort it took to kind of fall back into that routine. So that'll be, uh, that'll be something I miss for sure. Um, any other last thoughts? I think we're about out of time. Um, if not, I just want to thank TCAF for, for hosting us and, um, you know, encourage everybody watching to go pick up one of Richard's books. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're all of plentiful them. and <laughs> get all yeah. of them. And, you know, you shouldn't have any trouble finding them um, through any of your 
channels of choice, um, Poison Flowers and Pandemonium has just come out from Fanagraphics. Um, it's a great place to start. What does now come out? Oh, now number 10 comes out um, in about, I think, three weeks, two or three weeks. Um, no, maybe maybe three, three weeks, three or four weeks at the most. Um, yeah, look for it at your local comic shop, um, independent bookseller. Um, thanks to all of you for agreeing to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to you, Peter and TKF. And thank you, Eric and uh, Rena, Eric, Adrian, Dan. Thank you all very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, stay tuned. The next TCAF program up is Arsicoriac's Carousel. Uh, the T uh, TCAF would like to thank its sponsors. Our, our programming sponsor is Seneca College, the School for Creative Arts and Animation, with a special thanks to the Beguiling, I guess that's me, uh, Page and Panel, the TCAF shop, and government support from the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Art Council, and the Toronto Art Council. Uh, thank you all again for attending and do check out Richard's work. I'll be happy to press some of it in your hands when next you can wander into my shop.